overeducated, underskilled. Maybe it's the other way around, I forget. And I'm obsolete. I'm not economically viable. podcast slash vodcast of post post postmodern madness and societal decay. Today I will be talking to one of Las Vegas' most promising indie horror directors, Drew Marduk, the mastermind behind last year's neo-slasher flick Pool Party Massacre. Join us as we discuss the finer points of contemporary independent genre filmmaking, the trials and tribulations of marketing and distributing a low-budget passion project, and, perhaps most importantly, just how many bags of blood you'll need to effectively display someone getting dismembered with a power tool while sitting on a toilet. Let's hop right into the thick of things, why don't we? All right, everyone, welcome to yet another installment of Not Economically Viable, the podcast slash vodcast of post postmodern madness and societal decay. And if you know anything about me, you know that I'm a huge horror film fan. Been since I was a little kid. But I'm especially intrigued by the lower budget, indie, sleazy, slashery, kind of degenerate cinema horror films. And right now we're kind of going through a renaissance era. And today we have a very, very great guest. Someone who's really at the forefront of the new indie horror movement. All the way from Las Vegas, Nevada, we were speaking with Mr. Drew Marvick, director of Pool Party Massacre. Uh, Mr. Marvick, you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Well, it sounds like you kind of already did. I don't know if I could introduce myself any better than you did, but yeah. My name is Drew Marvick. I'm a a 40-year-old genre filmmaker of sorts who uh, plans on making a bunch of low-budget genre films, hopefully. And can you give us a quick overview of your uh, film career? I mean, how long have you been making movies? Uh, Well, I mean, I've worked in film for man close to 15 years now but uh my career started at well doing what i actually still do for a living which is producing commercials so um so my start was in the com- in on the commercial side of production like i said i still do that but i i always wanted to make films and be involved in film there's not that much joy in in the commercial side so finally after about 10 years or so I decided to uh, make my first short film which is called Scared to Death and that was about four four years ago maybe and uh, how did you get interested in filmmaking was there any particular movie or filmmaker that got you into making genre films I wish I had a great story I hear these other filmmakers when I listen to interviews or when I talk to them at festivals that have the, that one filmmaker or that one movie or that experience they remember going with their dad to see this particular film and that was the catalyst I, I unfortunately i don't have one thing in particular i was always fascinated uh by film i loved watching movies my mom my parents were both really into movies especially my mom it was in the 80s so she would rent tons of vhs tapes and illegally dub them onto blank tapes and we had this giant not for profit or anything but we had this giant library of every movie she had ever rented in our in our house on a wall a whole wall full of vhs tapes so i mean i grew up watching and and fortunately for me she wasn't like a helicopter parent so i could watch anything i mean at nine years old i had access to the texas chainsaw massacre and police academy and porkies and you name it, and The Exorcist, I could watch any, anything I wanted. Maybe she didn't know, but I had access to all of that. So I always was fascinated, and I think the earliest incarnation of that was I would make uh, little films with their VHS camcorder on my street with the neighbor kids and with my G.I. Joes. I have vivid memories of creating entire scenes with G.I. Joe and Star Wars action figures and then blowing them up with fireworks and recording it all. 
And you also have quite a bit of experience on the acting side of the equation. So can you tell us about your thespian experiences? Sure. I, I, I mean, other than acting in my own films as a child, uh, really my acting career started because I was a commercial producer and often would find myself on these low-budget commercial sets or even sometimes bigger-budget commercial sets where we needed an additional role and the director would turn to the crew and I was often the only person that would raise my hand and volunteer. So, I mean, probably the first 20, 25 gigs I ever got were simply just decided on set hey oh man we need somebody to play the pizza guy or we need somebody to run through the background we need somebody to to do this do that play the criminal getting arrested in the background things like that and before i knew it i had you know tw like i said 20 25 commercials under my belt and people started actually thinking of me some of these directors would think of me when they were pitching when they're bidding for commercials and have me in mind for roles and it it just kind of went from there. I really didn't have any intention of being an actor. I don't even really consider myself to be an actor, but I love doing it, and I rarely pass up an opportunity. And what was the transition like going from being a commercial producer and working in advertising to actually making your own films and being a film producer and director? Uh, it was shocking. I mean, fortunately, I was very familiar with the process, and... I had access to really talented people because I work around these talented people every day. So that was a huge asset, but it was also a big shock because I went from, you know, producing and working on commercials that have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes over a million dollar budgets to making like, for instance, my first short film, we spent on it was like 71 dollars i think was the total shooting budget by the time we finished and pool party massacre came in at about six thousand dollars so it was it was hard it was fun it was a great challenge and i actually discovered that i like working in that world even even better i really enjoy living in that world where you have to be resourceful and you have to think and you do you wear many hats because you're just more involved. I mean, I was involved in every I'm involved in every aspect of the process when it's something like that. And did you go to film school or have any sort of on the job training experience for other productions? Uh, I did not go to film school. I, I did in high school. I took um, I guess the best way to describe it would be an adult after school adult education classes at a neighboring high school for video television production and I actually got some form of a certificate I graduated from that but it didn't hold much value but I thought it was going to be it was going to help me get into a good film school at the time but uh, when preparing for college came around my my dad actually was the one that, that uh, told me not to go to film school uh, I, and at the time I, I'm sure I thought he was a jerk. Uh, I can only imagine um, the words that I that I had to say about him for for discouraging film school. But he he had a good good advice. In hindsight, he told me to go to uh, get a business degree, go to business school, get a business degree, because whether I go into film or not, I'm going to need a good head on my shoulders. I'm going to have to understand how the business works, and it'll put me one step ahead of everyone else. You know, nice parental advice. So. I, I took it, and that's the route I went. I, I got a business degree, and then by the time I finished school, I had kind of forgotten about film for a while. So I never never did go to film school. So my, my film education, other than in high school, came just a, as I started working on the commercial production side. And was Pool Party Mask your first full feature-length film? It was, yes. My, at least the first feature that I had uh, written and directed. So I'm trying to count up all the hats you had for this movie. You were the director, the producer, you were an actor in it, uh, the writer. Any other uh, terms that uh, we could apply to you for that one? I mean, I think you could safely put my name under almost every single role on the movie, except for cinematographer and editor. I was smart enough to let my partner in the film, Brian Mills, handle those two duties because he's much uh, more talented than I am, but... I mean, I had my fingers in in everything. It was a it was a really small 
small production, small crew. So, yeah, I was literally doing everything, sometimes almost at the same time. I mean, comically, I would still be in wardrobe holding a boom and rewriting the next scene all at the same time. And where did the general idea for the film come from? The basic, the, like, seed for the idea was very spontaneous. I was actually on the phone with uh, my partner in the film who shot it and edited Brian Mills. I was on the phone with him, and he he's a cinematographer, and he was talking about his how he had just purchased a new camera package and wished he had um, a film to shoot before he had to go back to you know doing his corporate work because he had some time off. And I just kind of jumped at that opportunity and sadly to, to say yeah, I lied to him and told him that I had a script um, that was ready to shoot and that if he really wanted to shoot a film, I, I, had a, I had a great script that was ready. And I convinced him that I did and he asked me what it was called and Pool Party Massacre just literally rolled off my tongue. It was the first thing that came out of my mouth. I, I had no thought of it really before that. And then that I actually had to deliver, so I locked myself in my office and started writing the movie that would be Pool Party Massacre. And about how long did it take you to finish the complete script for the movie? I wrote a draft because the whole thing was built on a lie. I quickly wrote the first draft in uh, probably three days and sent it over to him. And our original and my original intentions, at least, uh, were to shoot it as quickly as possible. He had about a month off, so I was going to write it the first week, cast it the next week, and then we'd be shooting by the week after and finish the whole thing in a month. Uh, but luckily for me, his time off got extended. He liked the script enough to tell me that to give me some notes, and I got to take some time. So it ended up. Uh, over a course of a couple months kind of going back and forth and doing some rewrites and fixing some things I'm sure it could have used uh, more but, but. Yeah. Yeah, and about how long was the pre-production process in the film? Uh, how long did it take you to get the entire crew together for, to make the production? Uh, getting the crew together was easy fortunately because like I said working in the business I already had a lot of friends who work on the commercial side that are very talented. So I, I had a whole laundry list of friends that I could call to beg for, for their help. Uh, it was the casting that, that took a long time uh, in the initial, when I, when we were going to try to make the movie just with no money, I, the, the initial, I remember pitching to, to Brian, my idea that we were going to make the movie for $11 and my wife, was going to play multiple roles and my children would play roles. My mom would, I was like, we're just everyone I know that I can get that I have access to will play roles. So once we decided to take it a little more serious and I, and polish up the script and take our time, we began the casting process and holding auditions. So that's, that's what ended up uh, taking the longest amount of time, but it still was only uh, probably, I don't know, close to two months before, before we were able to lock in the the awesome cast that we have and, and actually start shooting. And about how big was the crew for the production? It ranged from days when it was just two people, just Brian and myself, to on the larger side, uh, I think maybe seven people. I don't think there were ever more than, I mean, including cast, there were probably days we had ten people on set, but I don't know that it ever was bigger than that. And traditionally, filmmakers have had difficulty finding actors for extreme horror films like this. So uh, were there any sort of concerns about getting people on board when you have, you know, such demanding scenes of film? You got the nudity and the simulated masturbation and all the fake blood. Was that sort of a, a barrier to getting talent on board? It, it was definitely a concern of mine and somewhat of a barrier. It was something that I wanted to approach delicately because I, I understand that not everyone would be comfortable with that. So I, I definitely uh, was, was delicate when approaching it. But I, we're also in, in Las Vegas, so I knew I had in my back pocket. I mean, there are plenty of people here in this town that make, make a living without their clothes on. So 
I didn't think it would be really hard. The hard part was finding someone that actually fit the role and, and could act w- well enough to, to help carry the movie and also not be afraid to do those scenes. And for, as far as the simulated masturbation, um, Nick Byer, the actor who, who played in that scene, is a good friend of mine and a local actor who does a lot of work here in town. And he thrives on making people uncomfortable. So... So I knew he would be a great fit, and we wouldn't have any problems. But as far as the ladies, there was definitely that was something that that I had to discuss ahead of time and put a lot of thought into, which is what actually led me to casting Alexis Adams for for the for the role. Yeah, and for those of you who are not familiar with the oeuvre of Miss Alexis Adams. Uh, she's what we might call a non-traditional actress. So can you tell us about how uh, you got her on board for the move, motion picture? Uh, I, Luckily for me, we had mutual friends who um, had worked both in the adult industry and uh, I guess in the, in the straight film industry as well. So, so they knew her. And when I was describing, asking people if they, if you know, putting out casting calls and asking people if they knew anyone that might be fit, I mentioned that I'm that I'm looking for a girl who could play kind of a Paris Hilton type who has a nice wholesome look like very, really beautiful and well kept but not not covered in tattoos or with piercings which is something that a lot of the girls that auditioned had and, and I knew that this this character being kind of the the head bitch of this socialite group had to have a certain look so someone suggested Alexis Adams to me and look and then the rest was history but luckily she had this was her first really straight acting role so she was excited to take it on and I was excited to have her and and she did a great job can you tell us about the actual filming of the movie uh where did you film it and about how long did the shoot go in total well the shoot was a comedy of errors for about six it was about six months we started shooting on black friday actually the day after thanksgiving and of 2015 and then shot until june of 2016 okay. so it was a good solid i mean taking christmas out we weren't certainly weren't shooting straight through but working around people's schedules shooting on weekends shooting whenever people were available uh, so which is why it took six months i mean if we would have had a budget and could have made an actual shooting schedule it probably would have been a 10-day shoot but having to work around all that and there were often scenes i mean dialogue scenes where we had to shoot the two characters having a conversation three months apart i, I joke a lot of times when i'm at festivals with the movie that if you watch it carefully you could probably watch flowers bloom like throughout a conversation because they were shot uh, so far apart. And the lo- as far as the location, uh, it was a uh, all throughout my neighborhood. Uh, a portion of it's at my house. The intros in my backyard. Uh, the third act, the whole master bedroom, is actually my master bedroom. My wife and I's master bedroom. Uh, the other pool is my parents' backyard. Um, we used my parents' next door neighbor's house as well. So it was kind of a just a combination of the houses that I had free free access to that were in my in and around my neighborhood and when you have a shoot that goes on for that long i'm sure you've got some pretty memorable stories uh what's the most memorable thing that happened on set do you have like any memorable effects mishaps or just some really memorable flubs on the set i mean we definitely had a ton a ton of them luckily we didn't have any huge catastrophic like i don't have a story about when something went catastrophically wrong but we we unfortunately with the delays and casting and everything else, our initial sh- August shoot became, like I said, we started shooting in the end of November. So we shot through November, December, January, February, the coldest months here in Vegas. So uh, often blood would freeze when we would set up a shot. And by the time we could get everything in place and the effects gag in place and cameras and lighting right, the blood would freeze in the tubes and it wouldn't flow. So things like that would happen constantly. Uh, we also had one of the actresses get a boob job in that period of time between 
the first day of shooting and the last day of shooting, which became a, a pretty comical little anecdote for me. Uh, although no one's been able to tell, I think for some reason in the edit, you can't ever tell that the majority of the scenes were after the operation, luckily, but so far I've been waiting for somebody to be able to, to notice and point it out. Cause even myself, I haven't, haven't been able to find it, but probably the most notable thing that happened was just at the tail end of production, right before we finished the movie, I was um, a local producer on a Belgian TV show that was in Las Vegas shooting an episode. And while they were do- prepping, before they came, actually flew over from Europe, uh, somehow they must have Googled me or something, as, or been on my Facebook and saw that I was making this horror film, and they proposed an idea and asked if it would be possible for me to incorporate one of the people from the TV show into the movie and actually kill them in the movie and they could film it for the episode of their show and even though the movie was done I mean we literally I think we had two shooting days left at this point and I didn't but I didn't want to pass up an opportunity to have the movie featured on what was being sold to me as a huge TV show in Belgium with one of the a huge celebrity so I quickly wrote us wrote an additional scene and when they landed we incorporated it in and just this impromptu shoot which in the movie is Adora the crazy neighbor that's not speaking English that was that scene because this woman didn't in fact didn't speak English at all and I had to just quickly improvise that scene throw a crew together a day that we weren't supposed to be shooting and, and you know whip that thing up and it ended up being a, a pretty a pretty memorable scene in the movie and from my understanding the TV show is set to air in Belgium this April so I'm hoping that that will uh, catapult our our, our, sell, our sales in Belgium and who did the special effects for the movie so we had a makeup artist uh, named Katie Jacobs she's a local uh, beauty and effects artist here in Vegas who's worked on a lot of a lot of pro- she's all constantly working so she was the the key makeup artist but fortunately she w- was willing to do it because she's a good friend of mine and I kind of called in that favor but at the same time she needed to take paying gigs also so that she could continue to live and pay her bills since I couldn't pay her so she was there through the bulk of it and anything that looks good she did Um, there are days where she wasn't there where I would just kind of take over and improvise and do the best I could so there were so there were certainly scenes that might have had better a better effects gag if she was available that day but we couldn't pass up the opportunity to work with the talent that were available and the crew that were available so I would have to take over so which is why some of the scenes are less um, effects heavy than they were written in the script but she was there for the most part and, and sprayed a lot of blood and did a lot of did a lot of good work for me. And of course, I come from uh, the great Joe Bob Briggs School of Filmmaking where you can tell just how good a film is by the amount of fake blood used on it. So about how many gallons did you go through for this production? I think not, not as much as I wanted to. Uh, if going by the script, there would have been a, at least five more gallons, I would say, but... I would say we safely we probably went through about four four gallons, four to five gallons of blood. And what was uh, your... We had to we had to be careful because of the location we were shooting in is a really nice house, and there were plenty of things throughout that house that I'm sure are more valuable or worth more than our entire shooting budget. So that limited us tremendously so based on the script there were scenes where like for instance when the character Troy gets killed with the axe in the script the blood spray there's a shot of the blood spraying up on the ceiling fan and the ceiling fan distributing it around the room creating a ring around the entire room of blood well when we actually came to shoot that I, I there was no way I was going to be able to to do that so so there were definitely things like that that limited us but fortunately we were still still able to spill quite a bit and what was your absolute favorite kill from the entire movie oh, 
I think I think my favorite kill from the entire movie would be the clay character getting the drill through the chest kind of for a combination of of reasons I just really like that scene I like how um, it ended up cutting between the pizza guy at the door and back to him and I love Nick Byers portrayal of Clay I just think he's hilarious like I can still he still makes me laugh when I watch the movie and I it's funny to see how polarizing of a character he's become because I will read inter- um, reviews and and watch and listen to reviews and there are some where he is their least favorite part of the entire movie like that like they cite his character as the reason why they hated the movie and others where they loved it and people that ask send me and ask me if they could get his autograph and where they could find more of his work and things like that so it's kind of funny how polarizing he is but I think that that one is my favorite but it also was the most intensive I had to build that rig of the drill sticking out of his chest and I had to build a fake wall I mean there was a lot of work that went into that one as well and uh, you know you said something earlier that absolutely just floored me the entire production budget for the entire film was just six thousand dollars yes yep six six thousand dollars that was our enti- entire shooting budget and it was actually I mean I I never set a budget I mean I had mentioned earlier jokingly that, or it wasn't even a joke at the time but I originally wanted to shoot the movie for eleven dollars uh, I just thought you know what, let's make a movie with not spend any money. And I don't know where 11 came, it was just an arbitrary number, but I, I quickly realized that that, was, that wasn't that was possible. So it, the, the budget was just dynamic. It was just whenever I needed to spend money, I would assess the situation. Can I build this? Can I find it for free? If not, I'll spend the money. Otherwise, I build it or find it for free or borrow it from a friend or improvise in some way. So it, it just we made it to six thousand dollars and that's where it stopped but i mean there was never a point where we even had a set set budget the goal was always just to to spend as little as possible because it was all just coming out of mine and brian's savings accounts as as we as we went you know the amazing thing about pool party massacre is like sometimes you go back and you watch me from the 70s or 80s and you're like yeah that movie cost six thousand dollars but the cinematography in this movie just the, it has a huge high gloss look to it. It doesn't look like it costs only six thousand uh, so. dollars. Well, I'm sh- I'm sure. I, well, I mean, I thank you very much. I I appreciate that, and I'm sure Brian would appreciate that tremendously. Uh, luckily, I mean, Brian is he makes a living as a cinematographer and an editor, and owns his own production company. So he is very talented and has been doing this for a long time, and we were able to shoot it on he owns his own gear we actually were able to shoot it in 4k so uh, we had a lot of advantages that other filmmakers that are making a movie for six thousand dollars would never have i mean so fortunately for me i didn't have to rent the camera package or the lighting package or the audio package all of this was gear that between brian and myself that we we already own we were able to call in favors from people that do this for a living we, we, we didn't have to teach our friend how to hold a boom we were able to get uh, people like my friend Thanos and my friend Jake who also do this for a living on huge high budget projects and they were nice enough to come and help us out so I think that added a ton of production value to what we have you know to the movie itself but also things like the location and and some of the talent we were able to get i mean we were able to to kind of cobble together this great great crew and some great set pieces so i I mean i appreciate that the goal was to make something that that definitely looked like it cost more than six thousand dollars at least so it's good to know that we we achieved that that absolutely blows my mind i I couldn't fathom it only cost six thousand dollars uh, so yeah, just moving along, how long was the post-production cycle? Uh, particularly, how long did it take you to edit the movie, and were there any major excisions left in the cutting room floor? Uh, we we were in post for, let's see, we finished the movie in June, and we premiered in October at Fear NYC in Manhattan. So 
what is that four four months and we were editing right up until the deadline i mean i think we were the last i think they were worried that we weren't going to get them the movie in time for them to actually play it so so i mean post was was about four months but at that point uh brian who edited it had moved from las vegas to orlando which is what why he had some free time because he was in the process of moving so i had to edit it with him him being on the opposite end of the country so it was just it was a lot of phone calls back and forth with notes and and also working around our schedules he has you know he has a business to run and he had clients to edit for and projects to shoot and then coming off of shooting the movie for six months i was scrambling to get back into work so i could pay my bills again and stop stop living off my credit cards and spending all my savings on fake blood and prop weapons so so i mean it wasn't us we didn't get to edit it straight through so so it took some time but as as far as you know anything really hitting the cutting room floor there wasn't there wasn't much i mean we we didn't have we were almost in the opposite problem there's i mean there's a point in the movie that people often bring up right in the middle where there's a lull where the whole thing kind of slows down and there's a little bit of lag of a lag in the middle where the clay character is um telling stories and a lot of dialogue and the ferris bueller fight club thing and we actually trimmed a lot of that but didn't we were running out of things to to trim and and still have it be a at least a good feature length film we wanted to hit around a certain sweet spot that we thought most of the slasher films that i grew up watching and was kind of using this as a love letter to fit into so so no there's nothing definitely nothing major there isn't there isn't a single scene that was that was cut just some just some dialogue and that's it and the thing that really intrigues me about full party massacre and really you know any sort of indie horror going on nowadays is what exactly your distribution strategy would be because obviously back in the 70s and 80s it went straight to the drive-in straight to the grind house then in the 80s and 90s you'd go straight to video or late night cable uh, but today you really don't have that option. So exactly what was your distribution sort of strategy here? Was it just going straight for digital distribution or you're trying to find sort of a limited theatrical run, uh, even trying to get brick and mortar sales? What was your mix there? So from day one, I mean, from day one of shooting even, uh, my, I knew I wanted to self-distribute the film. That was always, that was always my plan. Uh, whether it would be successful or not I had no idea I just really wanted to I I mean I'd heard enough horror stories I have enough friends that are filmmakers and specifically genre filmmakers and I'd been around it for a long time and and I kind of had a a little bit of a bad taste in in my mouth distributors had left a a bad taste in in my mouth but so I knew that I wanted to self-distribute it for just simply for the sake that I wanted to learn. I wanted to use this film to learn as much as I possibly could about the industry, whether it meant that I didn't make a single penny of that $6,000 back. I was willing to accept that as long as I came out with the knowledge of how to do it for the next one. So going into it, it was always that. With that in mind, I still wanted... I I knew I wanted to have a physical release. I'm the kind of person that still buys Blu-rays, I have a huge collection. I have a wall full of DVDs and Blu-rays still, and I still buy them on a regular basis. So the physical, tan- tangible movie, I knew I needed to have. So that was always the most important thing to me, was having a proper, a real proper Blu-ray release too. Uh, giving the, and if anyone was gonna buy it at that time, I had no idea. But if someone was gonna buy it, I wanted to make sure that it had special features, that there was a reason to purchase that physical copy and so needed to have special features it needed to be replicated and not duplicated and it'd be a real blu-ray disc and the best quality that it possibly could and then from there i hoped to get it on itunes i was unfamiliar with the process but at that point i hoped to get it on amazon i hoped to do all those things and then i later learned that i could do those myself and and so we were able we were able to get it on iTunes. We were able to get it on Amazon. We were able to get it in brick and mortar shops, which was another thing 
point of pride for me, the idea that someone somewhere in the country at multiple stores could walk into their local shop, much like my local shop here in Vegas at Zia Records, or there's another one called Movies and Candy where I can walk in and they have a, at Movies and Candy, they even had a display for a while. I got a custom display made where they had DVDs and Blu-rays on right on the counter by the register. And so that, that was a, a big deal for me, but it was all, I, I was learning learning as I as I went and I'm still learning I mean it's still changing now I'm in the world of international distribution and um, you know working deals with with other territories and countries and I'm, I'm learning every day and what has been your plan so far for marketing and advertising the movie I uh, just a, a guerrilla marketing approach I mean really I, I using social media as much as I can and just trying to get get the movie out there. I mean, I did have a strategy, uh, just in the sense that I, I put thought into the things that I did. I put I put thought into the posts that we would make and the timing of releases, and the time and releasing certain information and things like that. But it was really just using. I couldn't afford to have a limited theatrical theatrical release, and I certainly couldn't afford to do traditional marketing. So. I just used social media and luckily the fans because we did start to get fans immediately and we have, I mean, the horror genre has the best fans in the world, which is hard for me to say because I am one and I feel like I'm complimenting myself, but but we do. I mean, because, I mean, there's no other genre where people, uh, you know, obsess over and have so much respect for and are so loyal other than you know in this in the horror genre so and and also they're forgiving so and they appreciate uh things that other people wouldn't so those that helped our fans helped us tremendously i mean those people were out promoting the movie for us and and helping us get the word out and uh even though there's quite the discrepancy in budgets there is something that your film has in common with the star wars and marvel movies of this world is that you actually do have Pool Party Massacre merchandise, including an official line of action figures. <laughs> that is true. That is very true. Um, it's funny that you compared it to Star Wars, because that's often uh, a line that I use when I'm at convention, when I have a booth at conventions, and people come up in awe that I have such uh, a well-put-together booth with a you know 10 by 10 full-color backdrop of the movie key art and I have the action figure and t-shirts, hats beer koozies pins, stickers posters uh, you know, VHS copies of the movie I mean I, I, I joke that I treated it like it was Star Wars and you know in a way it, it is my Star Wars I mean it's the it's the first movie that, that I've ever made in it you know it especially at that time I thought it might be the last movie I ever made I didn't know if I'd ever get another chance so I wanted to to do it right and I wanted to check all of the boxes the, off of my bucket list and I always wanted you know when I wanted to make a movie I dreamed that it would have an action figure and I dreamed that I would have a really cool poster which thank God or thank Mark Schoenbach from Satis Arts that we do have this amazing poster and I wanted to have a VHS release, which just came from me as a as a child, thinking how cool would it be to have one of my movies in these big clamshell cases, and now now I do. So, so I mean that was all just born from you know I, I guess the selfish in selfish ways that I wanted to have all of those things, but but I, but yeah, I treated it like it was my Star Wars. What a what an insult to Star Wars that is, but still. And have you been able to recoup the budget uh, so far? You know, I I probably have, but unfortunately, because I that wasn't my goal from the beginning. I mean, I would love to to recoup the money, of course, but my goal was always to use this as as like I said, as a way for me to learn to learn more about the industry and to get my foot in the door. So it seems like almost every dollar that comes in it just gets reinvested into the movie to order more shirts or order something else to get 
you know, to get a v- the VHS release, which was something that came later in the game, or to get some other kind of merchandise, or to get us help us get into another retailer, or to get to another convention, because you know conventions are expensive once you travel. You know, traveling there with all the merchandise, getting a hotel, paying for the booth, paying for power to the booth, paying for your hotel on your meals, and then also paying for all of the stuff that I end up buying, and that my I bring my now 11 year old son is works at the convention booths with me at almost every convention that we've done, so he has a tendency to spend a lot of the money that we bring in too when we're at the convention. So. So, I mean, really, I'm sure that we probably have, I mean, we, like I said, we have a lot of great fans and a lot of people that have supported us tremendously. So we probably have been able to, but as far as whether, do we have the $6,000 like in a, in a bank account that we recoup? No, because it just keeps getting put back in to keep the pool party massacre float floating. And as you alluded to earlier, I write for several horror uh, movie review websites, and I can agree that horror fans are very passionate. When they love something, they're the absolute best uh, you know ally and advocate you can have. But if they hate something, they're your absolute worst enemy, and they're just the pissiest people on the planet. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, what sort of reaction have you gotten from the hardcore horror fans about this particular film? You know, is it more general, negative, in between, lukewarm? I think it's been a really healthy mix. I mean, there's people that really love it. I mean, which which was a surprise to me, not necessarily because I think it's bad, but just in making it, I didn't know if anyone would like it. I mean, it was something that that I it was an idea that I had, and and it was my love letter to the movies that I grew up watching on VHS throughout the '80s, and there were certain things. That, that I was doing that I weren't sure if people would get or that I would do a good enough job to even convey certain messages. But some people definitely get it and some people are willing to to put production value aside or, or flaws in writing and things like that because they see what I was trying to do and they see the fun that, that I was having. And that, and that was my goal all along. I mean, I just wanted to make something fun that reminded me of those movies. I didn't want to make a throwback movie. I didn't. I didn't want it to be set in the '80s. I, I wanted to make a modern movie that I thought would evoke the same feeling that those movies evoked in me when I was a kid. I, I often say it's the movie that my 15-year-old self would have made if he were here today. This is the movie that that he would have made. So, so I mean, luckily some people get it, but as you mentioned you know there's also you know can be can be a, a lot of anger and with uh, reviewers in, in the genre and so there's certainly are a, a handful of people that hated the movie or just didn't get it or you know some of the if if the jokes didn't work for them and other people that are just unforgiving of you know a lower budget or production value or or quality of writing and things like that that you know that the movie does suffer suffer from and i i hoped that the charm of it would would uh, surpass some of those things but for some people it doesn't so i've had my fair share of of negative negative reviews but i haven't had uh you know i i read of incidents of just these online arguments between the filmmaker and the reviewer or or just the horror fan and i don't i haven't experienced that uh, probably largely because I agree with most of their complaints. Uh, I, often they're fair complaints, and if you know, and if they don't like the movie, that's you know, that's that's fine with me. I, I don't want to watch it again either, so it's hard for me to <laughs> it's hard for me to argue with that. Yeah, but how many different film festivals have you taken the film to this so far? I think we're. Geez, that's a really good question. Uh, initially there were four but then just over the summer there were a couple of really cool uh, drive-in festivals that popped up that actually reached out to me about screening the film and just some other smaller regional uh, festivals and, and showcases that people put together over the summer that where they were 
you know, less less of a traditional film festival where you submit your film to and more of kind of a genre showcase where somebody took the time to put together um, a weekend where horror movies were being played at their local movie theater or at their drive-in. So there were definitely a handful of those too, which were really cool. But I want to say, I think it's about four or five tradition, like real festivals that we were submitted to that we got accepted. And that's probably out of, I mean, less than half of the festivals we submitted to actually accepted the film. We got more rejection letters than acceptance letters for sure. Have you won any awards for the film or got any exclusive streaming rights deals worked up? Uh, we have. We have won a couple of awards. Shockingly, um, we, we won a, a funniest film award at the Hexploitation Film Festival in Canada. And we won, actually won best film. Um, hey, wait, now I'm starting to see a connection at another festival in Canada. Maybe this my move, maybe the movie appeals to Canadians more than it does to Americans because I don't think we won a single award at any of the uh, American film festivals. But and as for our, uh, streaming rights, no, we haven't. I mean, I've had a lot of offers. I mean, even early on from just the poster reveal before the movie was out, we started getting distribution offers. But like I mentioned before, my my goal from day one was to self-distribute and, and learn how this all works. So I've, I've just been consistently turning turning everything down and doing everything myself. I think I'm now finally at the point where I would entertain some of, some of those offers if they came back, especially if it was a, a streaming offer. I think at this point, um, the movie's been out long enough that I would, you know, in a perfect world, Shudder would would reach out to me about the movie just because I'm such a huge Shutter fan. But, but yeah, as, as of now, we haven't, we haven't done anything. I, we're in talks with, uh, potentially doing a limited streaming release with trauma and trauma now, just because I am a trauma junkie and, and they, uh, propose something. So, so that might happen. But other than that, and that would be a very, that would be a limited time deal. So, so nothing, nothing concrete yet. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about Pool Party Massacre, and you brought this up earlier, is that it's not a throwback slasher movie. It's not trying to emulate the movies of the old guard. It's actually trying to be its own thing and sort of make fun of the current tropes going on in modern society. So for you, what's the appeal of doing a straight slasher film like Pool Party Massacre as opposed to doing something that's more tongue-in-cheek or more self-reflexive? Well, I mean, it was tough. I mean... It was a tough call. I mean, Pool Party Master is a little bit, it is tongue in cheek and to a degree. And it is, I mean, there were so many, there are so many things that I wish I could, could achieve in making my first film, but, but I knew that I couldn't do them all. And so I kind of had to, you know, whittle, whittle down the list of things that I would like to try to accomplish because if I tried to do them all, then it would probably be unwatchable and as as far as making a movie set a period piece that was set in the 80s that was an easy decision not to do uh one just for budget reasons and so many people try to do it and aren't aren't able to pull it off successfully some do i mean movies like the barn that did a great job of it but so many other people on a low budget you know they just pick a couple make a couple wardrobe choices and hope that people will be forgiving and I, I didn't want to do that but I also really wanted to set it in, in modern times because there there is a little bit of a, a social commentary to it that I think more so applies to modern time with you know the with the kind of the socialite characters that these people are portraying that I think really only fit with uh, a modern time. And where do you see the future of indie horror and neo exploitation movies like Pole Party Massacre headed over the next couple of years? Well, I expect to see a lot, a lot more of them. I mean, that's the beauty of technology. I mean, at least, I mean, at, at least more people that making movies is a lot more ex 
accessible. So we're starting to see a lot of people. I mean, granted, there's a lot of bad. There are a lot, there are a lot of bad films coming out, and and that's not even a knock. I mean, I I made a bad film, so I'm not even trying to insult anyone. But there's a lot of, you know, it's it's hard to do on a budget. But I feel like there's a lot of people that are figuring it out, and since they have access to these things, they're actually able to put out, find a way to put out a film that even though it's lacking. In, in certain things and production value and you know ta- and, and acting talent or writing talent or whatever it is that, they're, that they suffer from because they didn't have the budget or because they aren't experienced yet they're still able to put out a product that's enjoyable and so I expect to see a lot I mean there's a lot of talented people that are figuring out how to do what they want to do with the assets that they have and that just really excites me because I watch a movie because I want to have fun I mean that's what movies have always been to me sure there are some movies that I really like that aren't fun that have more of a message or a little darker but for the most part the movies that I that I really really enjoy and that I go back to over and over again are, are the movies that are that I enjoy that I that I have fun watching and that fun can transcend any budget it doesn't matter if you had eleven dollars or eleven million dollars there is a way to make something that that's fun that makes me smile and enjoy my time with it and that's and i and i feel like we're gonna we're getting a lot more of that there are a lot of films that came out in the last year to two that are in this low budget world that I love, like I referenced The Barn earlier, Night of Something Strange, uh, Easter Sunday. I mean, there's all these, all these films that um, there's there's a, a Canadian filmmaker named Richard Mogg who makes movies for, I mean, under a hundred dollars, I think sometimes, and I, I just eat them up. I, I love I love everything he does. So, I mean, there's just a lot coming out. House Shark. From from Ron Bonk is coming out this year. I mean, a movie about a shark that like can come through the plumbing in your house and like the size of Jaws and come out of your toilet. Like those are the kinds of things that people are able to put together now with these limited funds. And it's I don't know, it's just an exciting time. And of course, the big question is: Are we going to get a pool party massacre too in the future? Oh man, I I, I wish that was a, a really big question, but. I think we are. I, I, when I made the movie, I had zero intentions of making a sequel. I mean, I, I guess mainly because my goal was just to survive making the first one. So that was my focus. I did leave it open-ended for a sequel, but that was truly just because all of the films that I was emulating did those things, and it was a trope that I, that I, felt, I felt like it had to be there. There had to be that kind of cliffhanger ending and, and leave it open ended but just because of the response and because of how much fun that I've had with the film and putting out all these products and going to the conventions and meeting people that actually liked it and even didn't like it uh, I, I feel like I have to now so I have started I have started writing the sequel I'm actually hoping to shoot it this year I'm hoping to shoot it this spring uh, not in the winter this time I'm going to shoot it when the weather's warm so the actresses won't be freezing to death and I won't have to have a heater just out of frame for every shot like I did for the first one but uh, to answer your question yes if if all goes well we will definitely have a pool party massacre too and are you working on any other projects? I am trying to I'm trying to work I have a lot of uh a lot of things that I'm trying to get done. I have a couple other scripts that I'm trying to finish up. Uh, a couple short films that I'm hoping to shoot soon. Um, I, I have to balance, juggle it all with um, my real job. So working on on the commercial side and on the TV side. So I've been able. I was been working on a Showtime show for a while and had a lot of commercial gigs. So I, I think right now I'm kind of in a phase where I'm trying to get my my life back in order working regular paying jobs and then once i as soon as i can get everything stable and normal again 
I will flip it all upside down and make another movie and spend all my money because that seems to be uh, my pattern. So, so yeah, but other than that, I've got a couple little really cool little things. Like I was fortunate enough to have a really small role in Wolf Cop Part 2. I mean, just like a little walk-on, like almost background role, but that was still like one of the highlights of the last the last year. And I was a, I also had a, a good role in the movie It Stains and Sands Red, which is um, doing really well right now. I just noticed it's in Redbox and on Shutter, So I've been able to work on some other other people's really cool projects recently, which has been great. So, and I'm even playing a, a killer Santa Claus in a short film called Axmas 2 right now. Uh, I missed Axmas 1, so uh, you got to fill me in on the plot <laughs> details there. Well, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think Axmas 1 just got released. I mean, it's a, it's a short film. I wasn't in the first one. Um, but it's a great it's a great little short directed by John Ward, and I believe it is part of a um, a DVD. It's part of a an anthology that was just released, and then part two will be part of the second second of that anthology. And and as it was described to me, there will be a third as well. And then once they're all completed, they'll edit together to be a feature. So that's I'm kind of excited about that. But I'm just excited that I get to run around with an axe and and kill people too. That's that's all that's all it takes for me. All right. Well, I just want to thank you so much for taking time to just get to talk to us today, Mr. Marvick. And of course, we'll let you wrap things up here. If people want to check out uh, Pool Party Massacre, what site, social media numbers do they go to? And just let you have the final word. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Like this has been awesome. Thanks for for actually taking the time and caring enough about Pool Party Massacre to want to talk to me i appreciate that and if anyone else that's listening wants to check out the film uh, you can find out anything you want to know about the movie at uh, poolpartymassacre.com or any of our social medias which are at just at poolpartymassacre on instagram facebook.com slash poolpartymassacre um the movie is on amazon it's on itunes if you want a physical copy Go to poolpartymassacre.com. We have Blu-rays. We have DVDs. You can get them signed by myself and the cast if that's something that you like. Uh, we actually have another, uh, I don't know when this will get released, but we have another VHS release that we haven't even announced yet um, that will be coming out on Valentine's Day, uh, 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 really. So uh, that's that's something new. But, yeah, thank you so much to anyone who listened to this, whether you hated the movie or, or liked the movie. I still appreciate you watching it. Once again, we here at Not Economically Viable would like to thank Drew Marvick for taking time out of his busy schedule to talk to us. If you'd like to know more about Drew's upcoming projects, feel free to ping him on Twitter, at Drew Marvick. And of course, you can learn everything you need to know about his debut feature film, and possibly scoop up a decapitated action figure too while you're at it, over at PoolPartyMassacre.com. As always, we here at Not Economically Viable would like to remind you that Every episode of the show is published under a Creative Commons license, so you are free to rip, dub, redistribute, and remix our content to your heart's desire. Also, you can now download all of our interviews over at noteconomicallyviablepodcast.wordpress.com whenever the mood hits you. Anywho, that's all we've got for you this week. Hang in there, folks, and we'll have more Tom Bully ready for you in just a few. (laughs) 